Hello and welcome to episode 36 of Radicals in Conversation, a monthly podcast from Pluto Press, one of the world's leading independent radical publishers. Walk into any European museum today and you'll see the curated spoils of empire. They sit behind plate glass, dignified and tastefully lit. Accompanying pieces of card offer a name, a date and a place of origin. They do not mention that the objects are all stolen. Few artefacts embody this history of rapacious and extractive colonialism better than the Benin Bronzes, a collection of thousands of brass plaques and carved ivory tusks depicting the history of the royal court of the Obas of Benin City, Nigeria. Pillaged during a British naval attack in 1897, the loot was then passed on to Queen Victoria, the British Museum and countless private collections around the world. Well, now more than 120 years later, the story of the Benin Bronzes sits at the heart of a heated debate about cultural restitution, repatriation and the decolonisation of museums. In November, Pluto releases a new book on the subject, The Brutish Museums, by Professor Dan Hicks, in which he makes a powerful case for the urgent return of such objects as part of a wider project of addressing the outstanding debt of colonialism. I'm Chris Brown, and I'm joined today by Dan Hicks, as well as Nadine Bachelor-Hunt, a journalist and broadcaster, Chris Garrard, co-director of Culture Unstained, and Dia Gupta, past and present fellow of Race, Ethnicity and Equality at the Royal Historical Society. Before we get started, it's time for me to give a shout out to our new Patreon patrons, and they are Laurie, Kyron Showman, Frank, James Lenoll, Gabriel Vogt, Camilo Perez Bustillo, Callum Humphreys, Wilhelm, Joshua Crabill, Jeremy Fisher, Kashi Street, Alejandro Luengo, John Pinto, Tilly Harris, Pinsuda Sorusa, Peter Hall, Emmanuel Petropoulos, Paulina Buda, Anthony Curran, Ludmila Diaz Andrade, Ton, Hugh Morgan, Rachel Smith, Charles Govan, Whale Gamal, Martin Hogan, Matt Zakiri, Kester Edmonds, Back to Books, Liam Bray, Michael Rosell, Chet Bramble, and Amber Watt. So a big thank you to all of the above for your continued support and solidarity. If you're at home listening and you want to know more about Pluto's Patreon, including all of the various member benefits, then you can head over to patreon.com forward slash Pluto Press. And now back to today's show. So hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to Radicals in Conversation. I want to start just by saying thank you, first of all, to Dan, Nadine, Chris and Dia for taking the time to come on the show. I'm looking forward to the conversation we're going to have. I think it's going to be really interesting. And for listeners, it's going to be revolving around the new book, The Brutish Museums, The Benin Bronzes, Colonial Violence and Cultural Restitution, uh, which is written by Dan Hicks, who's here with us today. And it's published by Pluto Press. It's officially released on the 5th of November, which is Fireworks Night here in the UK. Uh, it feels pretty appropriate because it's already made a bit of a bang, if you will, uh, forgive the pun. But flippancy aside, it's also a remarkable book uh, that's going to have a lasting impact. And it's one that Pluto are really proud to be publishing. So there's a huge amount we could talk about today. So we should probably just crack on. As there's a few of us on the call, I was thinking maybe we could just start by everyone quickly introducing themselves, just very briefly say who you are and, and what you do and what your sort of professional interest is in the, the discussion today. So um, Nadine, perhaps you'd like to go first. So I'm a journalist. I've been a journalist for coming up to two years now. Um, I graduated from uni a few years ago. I write about um, race, class and generally politics. Um, I've written about colonialism and decolonization, particularly with my experiences at university. Yeah, I think that's it, really. That's my main thing. Great. Yeah, thanks, Nadine. Uh, Chris, how about yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm Chris Garrard, and I'm co-director of an organisation called Culture Unstained. And we formed in 2016, and we sort of emerged from these art activist groups that were challenging and opposing oil companies like BP and Shell from sponsoring our major cultural institutions, so places like Tate, uh, the British Museum, the National Gallery, and so on. And so my work is 
primarily sort of research and investigation based, but but trying to get people in the cultural sector to to voice their opposition uh, to these sponsorship deals and shining a spotlight on why they're so problematic. In more recent years, we've started to make these connections between the legacies of colonialism and how they connect to these sponsorship deals. Mm, great. Thanks, Chris. Dia, how about yourself? Hello, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here and thank you for inviting me. I am past and present fellow of Race, Ethnicity and Equality at the Royal Historical Society. And my interest is mainly in museum spaces, ideas of colonial violence and what we might do to decolonize the whole process. Thank you. And so, Dan, lastly, obviously, you're the author of this amazing new book, The Brutish Museums. But could you tell us a bit about your own background as well, how you arrived at your current position and the thinking that's kind of informed the book? So you're thinking about these questions around cultural restitution. Of course, yes. I'm a curator at an anthropology museum at the University of Oxford, the Pitt Rivers Museum. And I've been here for 13 years as a you know, university professor and curator in a university museum. And you know, really, the book emerges out of the thing I've been having to you know, wrestle with, which is something that a lot of those people who work in museums you know, have been, you know, which is actually how do we speak up about the, uh, the role of our institutions in, in empire, how do we think about that role? How do we think about its ongoing, you know, nature in the present in relation to racism, in relation to, you know, inequality, and especially in relation to dispossession? Yeah, you know, when I got here at the Pitt Rivers, having been a doctoral student in Bristol at the time, you know, the last time that there was a lot of talk about, uh, about Edward Colston and so forth. I mean, I attended my first event to ask for the removal of the Colston image in, I think it was early 1998, you know. Um, and so I came to Oxford from a uh, city, you know, in the late, you know, I came here in 2007. And I came from a city in which these conversations about the ongoing, you know, legacies of empire in you know the built environment and in museums was was actually perfectly normal and i came to oxford and was really you know these were not conversations which were happening and in many ways they were not conversations which were acceptable so in some ways the book you know tells a story and is a product of resisting that sort of silence which has often characterized anthropology museums around these issues mm. Great. Thanks, Dan. So I suppose for, you know, I've been thinking about this book for the, several weeks now, but listeners may be pretty unfamiliar with the, the Ben and Bronzes, just full stop. But if you walk into, say, the British Museum or indeed any of well over 150 other museums and galleries across Europe and North America, you may see some of these artifacts on display. And I understand that Pitt Rivers has, I think it's 145 of these uh, bronzes, the Benin bronzes. So could you tell us, first of all, um, what they actually are, you know, where they come from? That bit might be obvious, but um, and how they came to be scattered all around the world as they are today. Yes, of course. Absolutely. And actually, I mean, there isn't any reason that, you know, lots of people should know a lot about the Benin the bronzes, because in many ways, African art and African culture has not been, you know, a central part of what we teach in schools. It hasn't been a part of even how you know, museums really, you know, foreground things that they have. And often, actually, when the story is sort of told and when the art is introduced, even actually the you know the ways in which these objects found their ways to, you know, Europe and America often isn't in, isn't actually told either. So really, I mean, the Benin uh, bronzes are one example among many of, you know, immense African you know, artistic achievements, urban civilizations as existed, you know, over a thousand years or so in West Africa. And, you know, as a kingdom, uh, Benin, which is now in Nigeria. And so the Benin uh, kingdom, you know, had been a really important you know, part of a wider set of urban uh, societies you know that had existed over those those sort of years and actually the making of the bronzes and the carving of ivories and this you know royal sacred artistic you know history you know, tradition was really a way in which ancestors were sort of honored so the ancestral altars in the royal palaces 
were not just representatives of the Obers, as they were known, the kings or the queen mothers or the other royal ancestors, they actually constituted those ancestors as well. Mm. And these immensely impressive objects were, of course, you know, part of this royal uh, sacred landscape in which Ober's houses were abandoned and allowed to become, you know, memorials, you know, sacred heritage, if you like. However, the Ober also was a key player in really, you know, resisting the rule of the British under the early protectorate schemes, various sort of treaties were were signed and so on. And then in order to remove him uh, and more widely the kingdom, you know, right at the end of the 19th century, you know, this this enormous attack, you know, one among you know, many uh, which were made in Africa, the punitive expeditions which were made and they're called punitive expeditions because of the idea that something had been done wrong on the other side. And mm. therefore, you, you know, actually you could go in and you could do anything you wanted with the Maxim machine guns, with the rocket launchers. You could just murder everybody. And in this case, you, you could also actually yeah, desecrate these sites and could, you know, take the objects so that's what we find now in the museums are these objects that were taken under conditions of really, you know, ultra violence in what was importantly a sort of corporate colonial grab. So this is a key moment in extractivist colonialism and the role of the museum, as I found out in writing the book, was actually much more important than we might think. Mm. You've just touched on a few things I was going to ask about there. So You've mentioned the punitive expedition in uh, 1897. So what was the ostensible justification given for the sacking of Benin City uh, by British troops? And what was actually underlying uh, the interest in the, the kingdom of Benin in the first place? You know, why were the British there? Of course. So, you know, the role of the Niger River in rubber plantations and the potential for a sort of rubber industry, but also things like palm oil. You know, these were, you know, I mean, the history of uh, margarine we think of as a fairly marginal, you know, (laughs) side to, you know, world history. But but actually the rubber for bikes and for cars increasingly as we moved into the 20th century, you know, the the sort of palm oil as was being used for foods and, uh, and indeed industrial uses. These were amazingly important, you know, resources and were increasingly needed by, you know, late Victorian society. You know, and there's also ivory as well in mm. the, you know, large amounts, which is sort of you know, going on. So this is, I mean, the really sort of horrible part of this is that we're looking at the grubby history of you know, billiard balls and, you know, the keys on musical instruments and, and you know, we're, we're looking at, you know, rubber tyres. I mean, this is the sort of demand side. How then that, that is then you know, justified in terms of the removal of, of a sovereign power, which was sort of resisting the sort of free-for-all, which was uh, going on up and down the Niger River. You know, that's absolutely the reason for this attack, but also a series of other attacks. I mean, as the book recounts, um, you know, there were a series of other, in these early conditions of the, you know, protectorates and informal empire, indirect rule, if you like, you know, this isn't a colony as such. It's a border zone in which, you know, the influence of the British and especially the corporate influence of the Royal Niger Company were being, you know, exerted in different ways. And so in those sorts of ways, actually, you know, then, you know, the levels of violence you know, that we see is really being sort of driven by purely commercial and corporate interests. In terms of how the expedition is uh, justified. Well, the idea was that an expedition, uh, you know, which which it was said was unarmed of just a handful of English men and colonial administrators, went to, you know to visit the palace and you know lost their lives as a part of that. Um, I mean, what's obvious from the literature in the book goes into this is how much of a pretext that was, mm. how much the attack by. Yeah, thousands of uh, your soldiers in response was not in any way a sort of directly, you know, justified thing. And of course, it plays into importantly this whole 
idea of your know, punishment, mm. which we see rattling down the 20th century in the idea of you know, reprisals in Ireland mm. or in you know, Kenya. Um, you know, it's just an old trick. You know, you say you can do whatever you want because these people are somehow, you know, they have done wrong. And, you know, there's a racial side to that as well. So for all those reasons, that was how they managed to or how they sought at the time to really, you know, justify this immense act of violence and of dispossession. One thing that really stood out, I guess, in the book for me was how, you know, you talk about how the looting of these royal and sacred objects is no more a side effect of empire and colonialism than the extraction of these resources is a side effect of empire, but actually that it's an enduring part of the uh, the ecology of militarist colonialism. So could you say a little bit more about what makes the, the kind of looting that took place during this uh, punitive expedition, during the sacking of the city, what makes this an integral facet of colonialism rather than just like a, a side effect, as it were? Yeah, absolutely. And so that is a really important element of the book, because for a lot of people listening, you know, with interest in empire, with interest in anti-racism, you know, art objects on display in museums or indeed you know, not on display, just in the storerooms of museums, you know, may seem like an irrelevance. You know, who cares about this? Let's sort of get on and fight, you know, racism on other fronts. And actually, I mean, what I learned in the writing of the book was that in this instance, you know, which which was a surprise, you know, that actually art, it turns out, really you know, did have an important role to play in this element of the you know, world history, in this incident and indeed others across Africa. So the dispossession of Africa, of course, involved the taking of land. Mm. It involved the extraction through the Atlantic slave trade of human beings. It involved, you know, the taking of everything. But the taking of art and the speed with which the ivories and bronzes, you know, within weeks they were on display in Berlin and in London after that attack. The fact that the museum, which was a remarkably at the time you know, new mm. you know, institution, the Ethnological Museum, the World Culture Museum, was absolutely the cutting edge device, if you like. And it was a device, as we know from the history of anthropology, it was a device for a science, if you can call anthropology a science, in inverted commas maybe at that point, because so much of it was a racial science. It was a science involved in the production of alterity, the telling of the story of these sort of racist narratives of the primitive, of the barbarous, of, you know, which, of course, is there to play into the what some, including you know, Kim Wagner and others, have called the rule of difference, the production of alterity in order to say, well, it's OK to take all these objects from people because we can appreciate them. But actually, also, these they are very different. They're exhibited in a certain way. They're not like Western art. And we can almost care for them now, despite the fact that these objects have been cared for, in some cases, for a thousand years in the royal palaces. So in the museum sort of galleries, there's really, you know, two things going on. There is the production of difference and the display of these objects to naturalise and to make endure the violence and the dispossession of Africa. But also, interestingly, I think also the racialization of the visitor as white. Mm. So it isn't just, if you like, the old narrative of the primitive. It's also the sort of flannery with which, you know, the Oxford Don in the 1890s or the, or the visitor to the British Museum at that time would have gazed upon these objects at a at a point at which they were also importantly, you know, celebrating imperial victories. So really waking up to that, the fact that the museums were not exactly, as you say, not some side effect, but really a central propaganda in some ways, but also a central, you know, technique or device. I call it a weapon. You know, the museum is a weapon as much as, you know, the Maxim or the various, you know, other weapons. I, have, I ended up in the writing of this book, I ended up you know, learning a lot about weaponry <laughs> in the late 19th century, which I didn't expect to. But certainly the museum is a weapon. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, there's a phrase in the book, which um, you sort of highlight as a kind of motto, which I guess speaks to what you've just been talking about, which is as the border is to the nation state, so the museum is to empire, which sums that up pretty nicely, I think. Yeah, it does. And so that idea is really, it occurred to me, when I was you know, making a visit to the British Museum and because of concerns over safety, I guess, uh, you know, the increasing sort of performance of security that we see 
happening now, not only at airports, but also at sort of you know, museums. In order to go into the into the museum, one had to uh, to join a long queue and to open your bag and to have it checked and so on. And that entry into the museum feeling like you know the crossing of a border or you know, you know, like you're at customs, you know, really set me off on a line of thinking, which was the fact that actually as Victorian technologies, I mean, the border and the museum are both artifacts of the late 19th century, and they both operate to classify and they classify humans into different sort of types, as it, as it were. Your your you know the border operates as we see at the Calais border as we see you know elsewhere in the world with the idea of uh, your fortress uh, europe you know you know the border operates to say that some people are more human than others and so does the museum and it was that realization that in some ways you know border work as we know from all the great activists and scholars of you know the changing regimes of borders that we're, we're living with you know today we learned that the border isn't only at the border where there is border work that's going on in the checking of your papers if you want to rent a house or you want to mm. register at university or whatever the, you know this is an earlier example of that happening in the museum then so this is a kind of border and it's a way of the policing of certain distinctions which are ultimately racial distinctions mm. I'm keen to get others involved, but just before we do that, there's one more thing I was interested in talking to you a bit about, because the origin, I suppose, of how these objects came to be in museum collections around the world. Okay, people might say, well, you know, the story there is is one of violence and, and you know, violent extraction, but they're here now. What the book makes very clear, though, is the continued presence of these objects in museums like the Pitt Rivers, like the British Museum uh, and elsewhere, that it's an ongoing act of violence. Um, and there's this idea, I suppose, that comes through that the past isn't actually in the past. You know, the history isn't over. Uh, could you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course. Um, an anthropology museum is you know, not a history museum. Historians think themselves into the past and work forwards. Anthropology and archaeology start with the present and work backwards. And the whole idea of the museum as a public space, and indeed where I find hope in the idea of the World Culture Museum as being something we might, you know, not only dismantle, but also maybe repurpose and, you know, reimagine, is actually as one that, that operates in the present and that really, you know, talks about and highlights and indeed commemorates the fact that empire isn't over and you know, many of its effects, which include, you know, you know anti-black violence, they include the complex relationships in between incarceration and race. These are things in which um, museums also as archives, unique archives of these really sort of poorly understood what the Victorians called you know, little wars. You know, we, we, we think of the Victorian age as, well, we often think in terms of our national history, in terms of empire or the world, as we think about the British as, okay, so there's abolition and emancipation, and then there's this big sort of Queen Victoria-sized gap mm -hmm. in between emancipation and, you know, maybe the First World War. Maybe we think about the Crimean War, you know, possibly. But in fact, in every year of Victoria's reign, there was, you know, what the Victorians themselves called a little war somewhere. And and often there were more and more of these wars as to, you know, time went on. So whether it's Ashanti 1896, whether it's the Sudanese battle of von Derman in 1898, whether it's the bombardment of uh, Zanzibar, you know, whether it is Ethiopia, Magdala, all of these are mentioned in the book. And of course, we need to we need to tell those, you know, those histories. So the bronzes, um, if anyone's got a copy of the book, they can sort of flip to the end and see a list of where some of the known collections are, where they're you know, on public display or you know, kept. There's at least 150 or more museum and gallery collections um, and any number of private collections besides. Now, almost exactly a year ago, so November 2019, uh, Jesus College Cambridge became one of the first major British institutions to announce that it would be returning one of the bronzes that it held uh, to Nigeria. Um, now, in this particular case, it was a, a bronze cockerel that had been donated to the college uh, right at the start of the 20th century. Um, and Nadine, I think I'm right in saying you were instrumental in the campaign to get that object returned. So, um, yeah, I was wondering if you'd perhaps like to tell us a little bit more about the events that preceded the college's announcement, uh, as I say, about a year ago. 
Yeah, um, so basically I started at uh, Cambridge in 2013 um, and I was studying um, Latin and Greek from scratch, a classics course uh, that Cambridge was running to get people from um, backgrounds that, you know, non-private educated kids into studying classics. So um, I, when I started, there was um, what I understood then to be a bronze cockerel in the hall. Um, it had a plaque on it with Latin that I couldn't understand when I first started because I couldn't read Latin properly yet. And then as a year went by and I started to be able to understand Latin, I started to be able to translate the plaque. And it basically spoke about um, how the bronze was seized. It used the verb rapio. Um, which means to seize rather than um, do dare, which means to give. So I was like, okay, that doesn't look great. Like, why was it seized? Um, and then I spoke to my director of studies at the time. Um, I think he's a professor now, Professor James Claxon. And, um, and I said, you know, what's the deal with this bronze? And he said, you know, it's worth looking into. I think he knew a little bit about it, but I kind of got the impression that he wanted me to investigate it. Um, mm-hmm. He was kind of into that kind of stuff, investigating things and and talking about um, secrets and things like that um so yeah he gave me some guidance on what to look for so I, I I did some reading on it um I learned a bit about Benin bronzes and realized that it was um taken in uh, the colonial expedition in 1897 and then from there I managed to get a few other students interested and yeah and then we we launched a committee and I won't go into the details because a lot of it was student politics and a bit dramatic at times with our local college student union but we eventually agreed on a proposal to send the bronze back um it got quite dramatic around the time because once the proposal was sent um to the student body the college saw it and that when once the college found out what we were planning to do they um just removed the cockerel from the hall without telling anyone so uh we just went into the hall one day and it was gone and I was like where is it gone and no one knew where it had gone so there's a bit of a running joke because Jesus's crest so the reason the cockerel was there is because Jesus's college crest is three cockerels um mm. and they have a room where I used to sit my exams actually just full of cockerels like ceramic cockerels glass cockerels it's very very strange and we had this um <laughs> we had this belief that maybe you know the bronze cockerel was just stashed away in this room somewhere but yeah so it was removed and then we sent the proposal after the college union agreed on it long story short the committee kind of split at one point because the um, nature of the proposal I strongly disagreed with the wording of it eventually we managed to reach a point where it was very clear that this was not to be exchanged as a way of Jesus College benefiting from the exchange or building a relationship with Nigeria it was purely for the ethical reason of returning Mm. because it was the right thing to do there was a bit of a debate about whether or not we needed to include an incentive in the proposal to make the college want to do it more. I was very against any hint of an incentive because it's not, it it shouldn't be kind of neo-colonial endeavor to return this in the hope of you getting something in return. So yeah. And then we met with the um, college's ethical affairs committee and long story short, the college decided to say to the university, can you deal with it? Um, Because they got a bit nervous because it started hitting the news. And then the university said to us, we are looking into it. And by this point, we'd had the support of the um, president of Nigeria, Mohamedou Buhari, and um, the royal family of Benin, who actually sent one of the people on the committee a um, sculpture, a wooden sculpture, thanking us for our efforts. By the time I graduated, the university, I think they were a bit nervous because I think that there may be Benin bronzes. I mean, Dan will know about this, maybe. He'll know if I'm right or wrong. But I think there may be Benin bronzes at at Cambridge in the Fitzwilliam. I'm not 100% sure. Um, but I think they were a bit nervous about returning the Cockrell and then realising that they'd have to start returning other stuff because, it, you know, it's almost like pulling the plug and then everything being sucked into it and everything coming out to the open. And then the college started saying that the university would deal with it. And then the university started suggesting things like loaning the Cockrell back to Nigeria and just ridiculous things like that, knowing that, you know, the president of Nigeria and the, the royal family of Benin wanted the, the bronze back and they've been calling for it for, you know, the best part of a century if not longer we got to a point where Jesus had well um Sunita at Jesus who's a master now she was the first she's the first black master ever uh, of any Oxbridge college as far as I know and she joined last year and she made a point of starting a slavery inquiry and also making returning the bronze a priority so she's made a decision that the slavery inquiry will go ahead and the bronze will go back and she's really shown decisive leadership on the issue uh, in a way that the university 
and the college just did not want to. I mean, some of the conversations I had with, um, I think one, I think it was a senior tutor and he, he was asking where the cockerel would go maybe. Um, and there were other members of staff that were saying, can we make a replica of the cockerel and all of this kind of stuff. And it was very strange. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, um, I think it was the start of an important conversation. Um, the college has connections with slavery via a man called Tobias Rustat as well, which is being investigated now. Um, but yeah, it, it was just a, it was, it made me realize an important part of decolonization is decolonizing spaces. And, you know, there's no excuse for a college like, um, Jesus at a university like Cambridge to still have these, these objects, knowing the history of them, especially if they're trying to make the, the environments more welcoming place for black students or whatever, that these things are there. So yeah, it's, it's really exciting that it's going back. And I'm just really proud of Sunita kind of using her presence at Cambridge and at Jesus to make really decisive action on this situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you know what the where things stand, I guess, at the moment in terms of the progress of the the return of the cockerel? Because um, I suppose it's been about a year. Um, yeah, so I haven't actually been in touch with Sunita. I think with COVID as well, everything's kind of kind of confusing at the moment, yeah. and nothing's that clear. But especially, I mean, I don't even know how Cambridge and Oxford are. I, I don't know how they're teaching or if they're running as they normally do this year. So I'm pretty sure she said to me once things start like properly happening when it comes to returning, that she'll be in touch and stuff. Because um, I think she said she wanted me to be involved on some level with the process. So it's exciting. Um, it shouldn't have taken as long as it did. I mean, I think we started campaigning for it to go back or started the conversations in 2015, mm. 2016. And it wasn't until last year that um, any sort of decisive action was taken on the matter, despite the fact, you know, you had a, a president of a country saying, you know, obviously Nigeria is, is not specifically Benin, but Benin kind of falls within the jurisdiction of Nigeria. And to have the Nigerian president saying, please return this, you know, we've been calling for the return of these for ages. And then to turn around and say, oh, we might loan it to you. Mm. Just very, very audacious yeah. and disrespectful. So, yeah, um, I'm very proud of Sunita and the amazing impact she's already having on Cambridge and at Jesus specifically. No, that's great. Thanks, Nadine. Um, I suppose I'd like to broaden it out then. This could be for anyone to jump in. Like, how do people feel like the ground has shifted on issues of restitution uh, within museums in recent years? Or even just this year, actually, like how have the campaigns like Roads Must Fall and other campaigns around decolonization of education and then the resurgence of Black Lives Matter as a movement again this year? How has this all fed into the conversations that are being had around repatriation um, and yeah, cultural restitution? I think when it comes to uh, restitution and, and, and things like that, for a lot of Black Lives Matter protesters and a lot of people that were in, for example, Rose Must Fall, it's about recognising the injustices that happened and the contemporary effects now and the way that it affects our curriculum, the way that it affects the way people think about Black people, the way that people think about African countries and things like that. So when it comes to restitution, you know, we use the term decolonize Cambridge a lot at university. It's not just about the action of returning the bronze. It's about recognizing we need to change the way we think about history and the way we approach texts and um, learning environments and everything like that. Because part of Black Lives Mattering is Black history mattering. If mass deaths of Black people don't mean anything to anyone to the extent that they'll have a cockpit in a hall just casually there, while people are eating dinner and, you know, going for breakfast, completely oblivious to how it got there. And there was no, no interest in working out how it got there because it concerns an African country. Then you, you aren't really valuing black people's lives um, mm. and black people's histories. Uh, so, yeah, I think for me, that's how it ties in. That absolutely sums it up. And you know, restitution is an African movement. We need to remember that exactly as is underlined importantly that the events of this year haven't emerged from nowhere you know their anti-racism is an ongoing you know movement you know restitution also has been going since the you know 1930s so and it was the roads must fall movement here in oxford that really for me was a personal you know, watershed i mean to hear the arguments which were put by you know, South African and other, you know, African students, Rhodes scholars, you know, colleagues, was a real, you know, wake-up call at the point at which the Rose Must Fall Oxford 
social media account uh, tweeted that the uh, the Pitt Rivers Museum is among the most violent spaces in Oxford. Suddenly, for me, it was visible that this wasn't only about you know, conversations or sorts of dialogues about how to how to tell the history, you know, better or more sort of truthfully. You know, the physical you know, presence of these objects on display every day that we opened our doors was a further act of violence, an act of violence that meant that some people felt they couldn't come into the space and that others who did felt that the violence uh, as really as survivors of, you know, that imperial violence, uh, of the corporate imperial violence that we're talking about, you know, that it was enacted again. So, yeah, it was a really important link you know, there, I think, with the Rosemans Fall movement. I wonder if I could come in here, Chris, and talk a little bit about black history. Um, sure. Uh, so this is my involvement with the Royal Historical Society, and I've been there all of one month. So, um, But in 2018, the Royal Historical Society published a, a, a race report that talked about the state of the discipline of history, really. And it discovered, and perhaps this is not surprising to any one of us, that history is the fifth least diverse discipline in the country. And then it went on to sort of look at things like student numbers. And the results were frankly quite shocking because they found that 11%, only 11% of undergraduate students were from black and minority ethnic uh, backgrounds. It gets even worse at the postgraduate level where you have like 8.6% being from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. And if you go further sort of down that academic line, when it comes to academic staff, out of BME um, academic members of staff, 0.5% are black. So there's clearly some sort of huge issue here with students firstly being able to access undergraduate degrees in history. And then if they had managed to cross that hurdle, going further down the line seemed impossible. And yet the, the Royal Historical Society found that when it was talking to black and minority ethnic students, to young people, they were passionate about history. You know, they were hungry about historical knowledge. And really, it was, I think, a failure on our parts in the sorts of history we were providing to them that just did not critically engage them. And I think this is where Dan's book makes such an important intervention, because it's really asking for a confrontation with violent histories of the past. And it's also amplifying the claims for African claims for restitution. Mm. Yeah, thanks, dear. Absolutely. It's been interesting to hear one of the common refrains from this year, uh, particularly uh, around the question of, I guess, the removal of statues uh, and other monuments to colonialism and slavery, uh, is that it's erasing history or rewriting history. And I guess we hear some of that same discourse around repatriation too. But, uh, you know, as I'm sure we'd all agree, it's not about erasing history at all. Well, absolutely not. So it's about understanding history. You know, I, and I think this this is where we have to be aware that the logic of the punitive expedition, the logic of the reprisal is re-emerging in, you know, what some on the right are calling the culture wars. Mm. How do you fight back against the progress made among the uh, the Black Lives Matter movement? Well, you know, you, uh, you say it's a culture war. You say that the toppling of Colston was an attack, which you need to respond to in some sort of conflict. And that, you know, really is, you know, one of the things that isn't in the book because the book was written, you know, before this happened, but it mm. lays the ground for us to see and in, in terms of what's now playing out is that how is you know, racism, how is, how is anti-racism fought? It's fought exactly the same as any old attack in Africa in the uh, Victorian world. You know, it's fought by saying that somehow... These movements are iconoclastic, they're criminal, mm. they are violent. Um, and then, you know, the real violence and the real iconoclasm comes in. Um, so we need to be very careful, I think, in terms of the way in which this is this is being talked about. And we need to see restitution not as an attack on museums, but how we're going to save them and make them fit for the 21st century. Yeah, and I, um, I, I completely, I completely agree with that. Um, the argument that we're erasing history by sending things back to where they came from and acknowledging that, you know, the conversations we have about the Benin Bronzes now that people weren't having, you know, the Jesus College um, Benin Bronze, for example, or no, we should call it the Benin Bronze that Jesus College had, 
and um, might be illegally um it wasn't spoken about before we spoke about sending it back to where it came from so that is the opposite of erasing history it's it's in many ways it's like archaeology you know you dig something up and you find out where it's from and and you know you you recognize its value and you learn about it this is what we're doing we're learning about our history and it is british history whether or not it's a nice part of history it is part of British history. You can't pick and choose the parts of your history and your culture that you like. It's it. This is some British people did, and we need to f- face and and you know acknowledge and tell these stories and show that the lives that were lost matter more than these delusions of grandeur when it comes to the British Empire have been this amazing thing. That that is erasing history. That, those beliefs, that whitewashing of history, is the eraser of history you know, pulling Colston's statue down and saying he was a slaver and saying, you know, we need to remove his statue because of all the terrible things he did. People didn't even know who Colston was really before that happened. It's educated people. It's not erased history. It's done the opposite. So yeah, I just, I just wanted to add to that because it's it's very frustrating when you see people saying decolonization is trying to erase history without actually engaging with what it actually means to decolonize something. It's actually to expand your libraries, expand the things you read, expand your understanding of history, expand your knowledge. And I think I can maybe come in at this point, and I, I think related to that is that what we're talking about is present tense as well. So we mentioned the refrain about erasing history, but there's also the other refrain that seems to come back, which is, well, it's in the past, you know, move on. But the reality of colonialism is that it's present tense that it's still being played out today and it's um i think the the phrase that in dan's book that really struck me is this uh, contrasting of durations and legacies and so in the context of our campaigning looking at uh the sponsorship of the british museum by a company like bp is that bp's origins are in empire and in that colonial history and in the theft of resources and so on. And so there's this very clear parallel. And and so as much as we're involved in campaigning to kind of end that relationship, in some ways it's probably the most apt relationship there could be between British petroleum, the symbol of empire, and the British museum, which is housing these objects which have been uh, stolen and taken. And the way that that is still being perpetuated is is really quite shocking in a lot of respects. So the various major exhibitions that the British Museum puts on are offered as a kind of shopping list to BP. So what is sometimes presented as philanthropy, so this generous company giving us this money to put this exhibition on, is actually transactional. There's a transaction of the culture and the objects that's happening once again in the present moment. And for BP, it's a a question of which of these exhibitions are most going to help us kind of burnish our brand, present us in this kind of progressive and positive light and and gloss over the reality of our business in the world, which is essentially built on environmental racism. And where the British Museum sort of becomes, I think, really problematically complicit in this is how it sort of goes along with it. So to give one example, in, in 2015, the museum hosted an exhibition called Indigenous Australia, Enduring Civilization, And that included many objects which had been contested and some uh, sort of the subject of restitution claims, such as the Guigal Shield. And we submitted an information request to the museum and said, have you consulted the Indigenous communities about how they feel about BP's logo being on this exhibition of their objects? And they came back and said, the majority of communities were not consulted about the sponsorship because we'd completed our consultation process by then. And at that time, there were Indigenous communities in Australia actively resisting BP, trying to extract oil in the Great Australian Bight. So there was this this kind of playing out again of the colonial attitude. So not only was there the taking of objects, that, that kind of... Um, looting and the theft of the past, but this kind of commodification of the objects again, in in some respects, that they were being made available to this extractive company that was perpetuating climate change, perpetuating extractivism and, and these impacts on communities and indigenous communities around the world, and offering them up as a way for it to enhance its brand identity. And the way the museum kind of gets around this is really leaning 
into this mythology around the idea of the museum as a neutral space, which I think relates to what Dan says about the concept of the universal museum as well. And that any time you try to bring to bear these critiques or, or challenge these ways of working, that there's this, this kind of sidestepping of the issue. And it comes up again and again. And, and this idea of neutrality, that there's not this participating in these issues, but that neutrality is a way of actually aligning with BP or with the theft and, and upholding those colonial attitudes to be repeated, the colonial violence to be repeated every time that a new exhibition opens with that logo above the door. That was Dan Hicks, Nadine Batchelor-Hunt, Chris Garrard and Dia Gupta. If you're enjoying today's discussion and you want to keep listening, then head over to patreon.com forward slash Pluto Press, where members can enjoy the unabridged version of this and previous episodes of Radicals in Conversation. And of course, a reminder that podcast listeners can buy the British Museums with an exclusive 50% off. Just head over to plutobooks.com and use the coupon podcast at the checkout. Well, we'll be back next month with another episode of Radicals in Conversation. So until then, take care and goodbye.